game. Sport, food, and a multi-million pound industry in the UK. Game meat, particularly pheasants and partridge, has become more popular in the last few years. To the consumer, the shooting industry presents game meat as wild, natural, free range, and ethically reared. But the industry has become increasingly controversial. Animal welfare groups have made claims of factory farming, the mass killing of predatory species, and the dumping of dead birds. So which side is telling the truth? In this three-part documentary, we will reveal the facts. It's just fundamentally wrong that people should get pleasure out of uh, killing live birds. And I think most people, when they see this and know the truth about this, um, will see that it's an anachronistic, cruel activity. Anything that involves cruelty to animals that is there to give some human pleasure at the expense of a sentient being, um, I don't think has any place in a civilised society. The Countryside Alliance is one of the main pro-shooting organisations in the UK. They promote hunting and shooting and have been campaigning to improve the perception of game meat. In their 2011 June press release, they claim game is wild, natural and free range. To investigate this claim, it is crucial to look at the breeding and rearing process of pheasant and partridge. The story of these birds begins in breeding farms. The largest of these farms are in France and Spain. More than 40% of the pheasants that are released in the UK are not bred here, but are shipped in from the continent. This is Betis Hall in Wales, one of the UK's largest breeding farms. The RSPB estimates the natural pheasant population in the UK at 1.6 million breeding hens. Each year, this number is heavily supplemented by the shooting industry. It is thought between 35 and 50 million birds are released every year. This footage from 2005 is of the breeding units at Bettis Hall. Since then, the farm has expanded and now produces more than 300,000 chicks each week. Investigations by animal welfare group, the League Against Cruel Sports, in 2005, 2009 and 2011 found the birds have no shelter and are confined to small barren cages containing one cock to six or seven females. I've been around the world looking at factory farm conditions for battery hens, for example, and when I see these batteries of pheasant cages, barren, uh, small devices that confine these breeding pheasants. You know, it makes me shudder. You know, it's clearly going to cause those birds suffering and it's got clear similarities with uh, factory farm chickens. After the eggs are hatched, the birds are kept in sheds with small outdoor runs up until they are seven or eight weeks old. Some of these sheds contain up to 16,000 birds. The large numbers and the cramped conditions cause extreme stress and abnormally aggressive behaviour. In this environment, the pheasants, like this one here, are more likely to be the victim of serious feather pecking and, in some cases, cannibalism. In order to combat aggressive behaviour, the industry relies on so-called management devices. This undercover footage shows small plastic devices known as bits being inserted into the beaks of pheasants. Bits prevent the beak from closing fully and can cause temporary feeding difficulties and stress as the bird adjusts to the unnatural behaviour. Until recently, removing part of the beak with a knife known as de-beaking, was also common. As well as bits, the industry uses devices known as specs, which limit the bird's vision. This is imposed on millions and millions of birds every year in this country, this country of animal lovers. 
it is it is hidden away it is behind the scenes and people don't dream of such a thing when they buy or consider eating what they think of as a very natural natural production it is the least natural you could almost that you could get research by the game and wildlife conservation trust shows that the bits can be effective in reducing the amount of feather pecking and cannibalism among pheasants. But the bits themselves can cause damage to the birds. There are different sizes to be changed as the bird grows. This is not always done as often as necessary, and ill-fitted bits can cause permanent damage. After life in the sheds, the birds are moved to release pens around the age of eight weeks. Unlike wild pheasants, these birds do not have to find their own food and water, as it is provided until they are shot. The release pens are open, and once the birds are strong enough, they are physically able to fly over the fences and leave the pen. But the fences are also built with low-level entry holes, and the birds are actively encouraged to return. By keeping them in captivity, it is easier to round them up before shooting begins. Research by the Game and Wildlife Conservation Trust in 2007 suggests that less than half of the pheasants departed permanently from the release area. Well, because the game birds have been bred in such uh, inhumane and unnatural environments, once they are released into the wild, they've not the faintest idea how to fend for themselves or avoid predators. So many of them starve to death or are killed by predators. And this is all before they're flushed before men with guns and shot. In this chapter, we have seen the small barren cages that prove the birds are not free range, but are actually factory farmed. We've seen the management devices that prevent a natural life. And we've seen how at no stage in their lives, the cages, the sheds, or the pens, can they be considered wild. In the next chapter, we will look at the mass killing of other species to protect these birds. In this chapter, we will discover the vast numbers of animals that are killed by shooting estates to protect the birds before they are shot. Predator control, the motivation for it, is not about protecting the, uh, the game birds uh, for their own welfare and well-being. It's all about cash. And the more birds they have to shoot, the more money they can make. All across England, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland, in the name of predator control, Millions of animals are snared, trapped, shot or poisoned every year. The most common method of predator control is snaring. Snares are thin wire nooses which can trap any animal which steps through them. Well, I think snares are one of the most, probably the most barbaric way of trying to catch an animal uh, and uh, the fact that we still uh, allow people to snare, I find, um, frankly, offensive. According to annual RSPCA inspectorate surveys, only a third of the animals were actually the species intended to be caught. Cats were trapped in the largest numbers, but many badgers and dogs were also caught. Other snare victims include deer and squirrels. Now the concern we have is that the injuries can be quite significant caused by the stress. It can be strangulation, they can die by being strangled in the snare. But equally, if, for example, an animal breaks free from a snare and runs off with the snare still attached to it, the chances are that will die, it will be injured, it will have infection, get in any wounds, it will probably die of starvation. At the RSPCA are of the view that the long-term aim will be for snares to be banned. This is Haddington, in the southeast of Scotland. Julie Renton had three cats. Her youngest, Tom, became the victim of an illegal snare. He used to jump up on the wardrobe, and during the night I always felt the thud on my bed. Because <laughs> he'd just jump down with an almighty thud. Um, and he'd always come in, you know, for a cuddle. Julie helped deliver Tom in their house, and he soon became an important part of the family. In March 2011, he uncharacteristically disappeared. Julie feared the worst. 
This is the field where Tom was found. The illegal snare was tight around his neck and wrapped around the wire fence. He was hanging dead. It was just, just, just so special. <laughs> he was the only, only boy, because um, I'm having two daughters, always <laughs> class them as my boy. just pointless how it happened. There's no need for it. Definitely not. If anything can be done that saves anybody else's pet, you know, it's, it's got to be done. Most people in this country uh, probably don't know about the hidden extensive use of snaring. And many often think it's banned already, probably. Well, it isn't. And we're one of the few countries in Europe where the uh, use of snares is not banned already. It is not only land mammals that are targeted by shooting estates, birds are also routinely killed. The shooting industry considers species such as buzzards, sparrowhawks and hen harriers to be harmful to the pheasant and partridge populations. Bird of prey poisonings are at an all-time high with incidents concentrated around areas where there are lots of shooting estates. But I think the most worrying aspect of this is that people are going unprosecuted for this. In the 2010 RSPB bird crime report, North Yorkshire is named as the UK's worst area for bird crime, with 10% of the reported shooting and poisoning incidents. Birds are also often targeted through the use of traps, such as ladder or larsen traps. Larsen traps use a decoy bird, such as a crow or magpie, to lure other birds. In the 2006 Animal Welfare Act, it states the decoy bird must have sufficient food, water and shelter. Yet this law is often ignored. This footage shows traps from the Telscombe and Stonehouse estates where the food is inedible and the water has dried up. And this footage from 2009 shows what can happen when birds are caught in a trap. You got him. After the perpetrator, Edward Lucy, was traced, he was convicted of killing wild birds under the Wildlife and Countryside Act. The Game and Wildlife Conservation Trust's research into the fate of released pheasants makes no distinction between pheasants killed by land mammals or raptors, although it does indicate foxes are the main predatory group. In addition, organisations such as the British Association of Shooting and Conservation admit there is not adequate scientific evidence to prove the extent to which raptors kill pheasants and partridges. This begs the question, are all of these birds, including many endangered species, being killed for no reason at all. And it is not only snares and traps that are killing animals perceived to be a threat to game birds. This is the Forbes family, who live near Kirimur. In July 2011, their dog, Popeye, which had been in the family for 15 years, went missing. He was last seen by a neighbour near pheasant pens about a mile from the family home. Just kept searching and after, it must have been about three hours or something, we came across a bit of freshly dug ground in a sort of area away from anywhere and just started to kick about it with my boots and weren't getting anywhere. So I went over to the trees, got some branches and then started digging and within a couple of minutes we came across white fur. And even still then we were in sort of shock, we thought sure that it can't be. There's a shot wind there. It's like a part of your family being murdered. It's, it's just like one of the children being murdered. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I'd had him since he was born. He, he was, was part of the family. Yeah, he was definitely part of the family. Popeye had been shot by the local gamekeeper. His collar was removed and hidden. He was buried in a shallow grave, and the gamekeeper told no one about it. After being interviewed by the police, the gamekeeper claimed he did not know the dog. 
The Forbes family have lived half a mile down the road for the last 12 years. Well, the gamekeeper, I mean, he's, he's threatened people. I mean, there's been um, somebody with a walk, dog taking it a walk and he threatened a dog and said it's a dead dog walking and they were just instantly walking their dog. But to think someone could be so cruel. I mean, it's just so senseless because there was no need for it. There was no need. He's never chased livestock or pheasants no. or anything in his life. By law, if a gamekeeper or farmer shoots a dog, they must report it within 48 hours. This was not done. Since Popeye was killed, no charges have been brought against the gamekeeper. Popeye is just one of the many examples of innocent pets being killed by the shooting industry. In this chapter, we have revealed the devastating effects of predator control. It is clear that if the shooting industry did not release large numbers of birds for shooting each year, the mass killing of land mammals, birds of prey, protected species and domestic pets would not happen. In the final chapter, what happens after all these animals have been killed? The shoot. In this chapter, we answer what happens on a shoot. The partridge season begins on September 1st and the pheasant season on October 1st. Up until February, shoots are organized across more than 2,000 estates. Shoots are either run by the estates themselves or the land is leased out to shooting syndicates. Since 2007, it has no longer been necessary to obtain a game license to shoot pheasant and partridge and anybody can pick up a gun. Controversially, children are being actively encouraged to handle guns and the Countryside Alliance has been promoting shooting for young people. The truth is these things are lethal weapons that uh, can and do kill people and are certainly used on a regular basis to kill millions of, of wild animals every single year and to uh, you know, expose children to that I think is morally repugnant. In recent years the shooting industry has been keen to shake off its elitist and privileged image. Most of the shoots advertised on the popular shooting website Guns on Pegs are between 800 and 1500 pounds for a day although some shoots are 2500 pounds for one person for one day. The shoot itself is strictly managed. Each shoot is split into sections known as drives. According to the British Association for Shooting and Conservation, on the classic pheasant drive you will have two woods, or coverts, on facing sides of a valley. One wood will contain the release pen, which the birds regard as home. The other wood is where they forage for food. Beaters spread out in lines, and as they walk through woods or crop cover, they push the birds up into the air and over the guns. If the shoot covers a large area, the gamekeeper and dogs will have been out early in the morning to force birds into smaller areas for beating. Nothing is left to chance, and beaters also hold flags which they can use to turn any stray birds towards the guns. The aim is to kill the bird with a clean shot. But without any training regulations or need for licenses, the skill of the gun varies wildly. As seen in this footage from 2009, many shots miss the birds and others only wound them. Most of the birds when they hit the ground you'll see them flapping around in distress. They're obviously hurt and maimed. And it can take many, many minutes before either a dog gets there or the shooter bothers to bend down and finish the bird's life. So it's a dreadfully cruel and an imprecise sport. Sudbury, South East England. This area is home to the Aubreys, a large estate used for partridge and pheasant shooting. Since 2000, this has been the battleground for an ongoing dispute between the estate's owner, Nigel Burke, and local landowner, James Wheatley. I'm certainly not anti-shooting. I actually shoot myself um, in a limited way and for a good purpose. I have a shoot that surrounds my land. This particular shoot has shot from on my land it has shot into my land, it has put dogs in, it has left dead animals, it has left wounded animals, it has left spent shot, 
empty shells. And at the end of the day, I've had to clear this up. Mr Wheatley had made an agreement for his land to be used for shooting at a maximum of four times a year. But when returning from an extended trip, he was surprised to find regular shoots and his land being used without permission. After raising the matter with Mr Burke and the local gamekeeper, he has been subject to a campaign of aggression. And for objecting, I found more dead animals, always surprisingly near the boundaries. I've been intimidated, I've been assaulted in my car. Mr Wheatley took the matter to the British Association of Shooting and Conservation, who he describes as being helpful, and they expressed concern about the conduct of the shoot. But as the Aubrey shoot is not officially registered with the British Association of Shooting and Conservation, they referred the matter to the Countryside Alliance. The Alliance responded to say they were looking into the matter, but still no further response has been received and the disputes has continued. At the end of the day, there is no one out there to protect me from this sort of harassment and encroachment. These guys are completely fireproofed in civil law. The shooting industry estimates that 19 million birds are shot each year. This has been a steady increase over the last few decades, a direct result of the intense factory farming. Some of the pheasants and partridges sold in supermarkets and restaurants are bred specifically for food and are not supplied by shooting estates. Traditionally, each gun will be given a brace of birds. Small game dealers will buy some of the pheasants from the shoot and some will go to the beaters and their families. But with shoots regularly killing upwards of 400 and 500 birds, what happens to the shot birds that are not eaten? I discovered in the back of his freelander about 30 birds, maybe more. I, I asked him what he's going to do with them and I was told nothing, they're going to get dumped. In 2006, the government commissioned a report into shooting sports, known as the PASEC report. But the only research conducted was by sending questionnaires to the shooting industry itself. The report claimed that 99% of the birds shot were eaten and there was no evidence of dumping. We can now reveal these claims are inaccurate. For years, it has been rumoured that the number of birds shot is higher than the demand for food. In 2004, the Daily Mail reported the dumping of birds in Suffolk. And the following year, animal welfare group The League Against Cruel Sports began an investigation into pheasant dumping. This is undercover footage from 2005 on the Stipe estate in Berkshire, showing a gamekeeper dumping in a hidden pit. This is the Bradenham estate in Buckinghamshire, where investigators found more than 100 birds mixed with shotgun casings and champagne bottles. This footage from 2009 shows dumped pheasants in Wales. This pit of dead animals was found on the Glen Ogle shooting estate in Scotland. Owned by John Dodd, the founder of the Artemis Investment Company, the estate promotes pheasant, partridge and grouse shooting. It is one of the wealthiest shooting estates in the UK, but has recently been in the news for cases of raptor poisoning and illegal poison carbifurin was also found here. This is a stink pit. Predators are lured to the pit by dumped animals to be caught in snares. This stink pit on the Glen Ogle estate uses dumped pheasants as bait. In 2011, three stink pits were found on the estate with evidence of pheasant dumping. It would appear that the government commissioned PASEC report is misleading and all over the UK, huge numbers of pheasants are being killed and then thrown away. I think it's a myth that this is a food production industry. It isn't, it's about killing. We obviously see some game on celebrity TV chefs' plates but the vast majority of people do not eat game, and a lot of it is dumped. In this film, we have looked at many aspects of the shooting industry. 
This is not an exhaustive investigation, and some questions remain unanswered. But we have seen the factory farming of birds for shooting, the high numbers of other animals killed in the name of predator control, the conduct of a shoot, and evidence of the dumping of birds. Society is developing and moving on all the time. We're becoming more humane, more considerate about our environment. And something like, you know, shooting live birds for fun, it has no place in a modern society like Britain today.